Welcome London to this edition of the Manish Tiwari show. One of the reasons I love London is the truly kaleidoscopic range of people who live here. And some of them are truly, truly, truly amazing souls. We have someone with us today on the show who I believe is an exceptional person who gives this great city a new dimension and whose service to the city, to this country, and to the world is truly remarkable. Now, before we move on and introduce our sister, Jenti to the audience, I would like to share a small story. So a few years back, uh, I went to uh, the center, which is the Brahma Kumari Center, which happens to be somewhere close to Neeston. And uh, I walked in there, and uh, I was told that, would you like to do a small interview? And I'd never done that before in my life. So I asked, uh, who would I interview? And uh, they told me, Sister Jenti. And I said, OK, let me try, because I always wanted to do that, but I had never done that. So we went, we went on the stage, and I had a conversation, just like today, with Sister Jenti. And that was a seed which was sown into the soil. And today, the manifestation is this particular show, where I'm now talking to people who make a difference to this great city. So Sister Jenti, welcome to the Manish Tiwari Show. Manish Pai, it's a pleasure to be with you again. Thank you. Before we move on, I would like to say a few words about BK, Brahma Kumaris, and my impression of it. So I kind of, uh, I'd never known about it uh, earlier, uh, except that when I moved to Mumbai, uh, the place where I used to live in Lokhanwala, there was a center, and I used to see this bright red light uh, coming out. And it used to just make me wonder, what is this? Uh, well, it was kind of, I was just curious, and possibly once I just happened to walk to them. And in those days, I had difficulty in finding accommodation because Bombay is, as you know, a city which has a huge premium on uh, living uh, residences or, you know, accommodation. So I always used to be in trouble because my income was not that much. Uh, so I think I had some difficulty, but somehow I landed as a PG in this gentleman's house and right across the street was this BK Center. So once I went and uh, met the lady there. So that was my very brief uh, introduction. Uh, and of course, uh, much later I discovered that my mother had put uh, Babaji's picture in my room uh, when I went back home. So there was a picture there of uh, Brahma Baba. Uh, eventually when I moved to London and uh, here I walked into Covent Garden and there was this BK, small BK Center uh, and in those days, it was uh, kind of uh, a deja vu that I'd seen this in Lokanwala. And I walked in there, and it was very cool because there was this small room where you could just walk in and meditate for a few seconds or minutes or whatever you wanted to. So it was very, very different. And uh, subsequently, I did visit the PK Center in Neeston. And one thing which stood out was whenever I went there, uh, irrespective of how much mental turmoil I was in or I've, if I was like not really uh, you know, walking past the surrounding, not really feeling great. But the moment you entered, it was a different atmosphere. It was serene, it was peaceful, it was clean, it was clutter-free, and it was always, the people always are like almost angelic. I mean, it's unbelievable. You know, sometimes you feel that how can people be so like this? <laughs> so, uh, you know, it was always that kind of uh, kindness and uh, serenity which always kind of, uh, you know, entered into me whenever I went there. And uh, so I do quite often go there, uh, not very uh, often because it's a bit far from where I live, but um, whenever I've been there, it's been a rewarding experience. And my association with BK, to that respect, has been uh, of uh, you know finding that peace, serenity, and uh, uh, how do I define it? I mean, there, there's, a, there's a certain amount of beatific side to it, you know, some kind of angelic force, which I feel is there. Uh, coming to the show, uh, I just want to say that uh, Sister Jayanti heads that center. I don't know if I can say head of that center or heads the BK UK organization. But whatever it is, uh, she's the soul who is at the helm of affairs. Uh, over there, and she embodies everything uh, which BK stands for. 
So, uh, Mr. Jayanti, over to you. Uh, would you like to, I mean, uh, pardon my rambling, but would you like to share uh, and tell the viewers what does BK actually stand for? Thank you, Manish Pai. I didn't know you had such a long range of time span with the Brahma Kumaris, so it's lovely to know that. And um, Brahma Kumaris is a spiritual university, and we come together from all religions and faiths to study the spiritual dimension of life. The founder had had visions early on in the 30s, and he saw that there was a world of turmoil that needed to change, and that the way change could happen would be through spiritual knowledge, spiritual education. And so that's how we started. And so this is the essence of what Brahma Kumaris do today. We come together to study more about the self, to know more about the divine, and how to make that connection between the soul and the divine being, so that we're able to draw those qualities within ourselves and use those qualities in a very real way in our practical life in the world today. And especially when there's a situation like the world is now going through this pandemic, what we found is that when we connect with the divine, we're able to draw the love, the power, the strength to be able to cope with all the challenges that life is bringing always, but especially now at this, at this moment of time. And so at a time when there's so much uncertainty in the world, meditation and the connection with the divine brings a form of stability within, in which I know that things are going to pass, things are not going to be like this forever, there's hope for the future, and that's what we're looking towards. Thank you. So, you know, one of the things which astonished me, because last year I was part of the event uh, uh, with Sister Shivani, uh, and uh, I kind of went through the footprint of the BKs. And what truly astonished me that it's, it's a worldwide organization. It's not just in London, not just in India, but it happens to be in most parts of the world. And it's not right. just in a small way, but in a substantial way. It happens to have created a truly global movement across people of different faiths, cultures, and nationalities. So that yes. I find is like a true achievement uh, would you like to tell us, uh, tell the viewers, like in which parts of the world you are, and I uh, even hear that you are in Saudi Arabia and some of the Gulf countries, which again, I mean, would be a challenge. Uh, I perceive it might be a challenge. So, would you like to talk about that? Um, yes, meditation is something which is at the heart of every tradition, or even I would say of people for no tradition. Meditation is something that's opening its way to be able to help people across the world. So whichever part of the world you live in, whatever nationality, racial background, ethnicity, whichever language you speak, you'll probably find a BK center near you. And so we exist in 120 countries across the whole globe. So that's the whole span of the different religions and so on. And yes, we have a center in the UAE, several centers in the UAE in the different Emirates. And we also have a center in Oman. So there's different things going on all over the world, everywhere. Um, because meditation is something which is of the inner being. And when we think about the soul, the being that I am truly within, then it doesn't matter where the body is from or whether it's one gender or the other, whether it's one nationality or the other, or age, none of these things make a difference because we're talking about the inner being, the soul. And so this is why um, we have local people in each of these countries uh, practicing these ideas, teaching these ideas, and it's compatible wherever it is you live, whatever it is you're doing. But it's something that the spirit is seeking. Each one of us is seeking peace and love and truth and joy. And meditation is the door that opens the way for that so that everybody can have that experience. Thank you. So I think you already answered my question, but I still would like to know, uh, are there any central tenets or values uh, which BK stands for? Definitely. I think maybe there are five things that I would like to mention. Um, 
peace, love, truth, joy, and purity. These are the essential ingredients of the human spirit, and that is universal. All souls have this experience. And the teachings of the Brahma Kumaris remind us that this is who we are, and these are the things that we have to follow through in our life. And of course, when my mind is associated with my physical identity, I lose contact with these qualities. And so what we are seeing around us in the world is a search for peace, the search for love, for truth, and so on, because these are the essential ingredients that the, the inner being, the soul, is actually made up of. And so when we don't experience them, we feel a big emptiness inside. And this is what people are experiencing. And so on the one side, we see the negativity, the darkness of the world. But on the other side, we see the growing interest in spirituality and meditation and people coming in search of all of these qualities. And in fact, since the pandemic started, more and more people are joining our classes on Zoom and all the meetings and programs that we are having. Like, for example, the Diwali program we had last weekend, um, the last figure I heard was that it was about 6,000 people who joined in for that. Um, but since then, probably the number has escalated even further. But, um, you know, if we'd had a program at our premises in Global House, we would have been maybe having 600, 800 people. But from hundreds, it's actually zoomed up to thousands now. It's an indication of how much people are interested in these things, because I think that many of the things that people relied on for support from the world outside, you know, we used to go out, have parties, have gatherings, have yeah. meetings, um, all sorts of things. Now we can't do any of those things. So we are at home. On the one side, it's good. We're able to give time to our families. But on the other side, there's a sense of missing all of this. And so I think people are finding new avenues to explore. And the most beautiful adventure is of the journey inwards. Mm -hmm. And so many, many people are turning in that direction and wanting to find out more about the self and meditation. Great. So, you know, one of the things which I've noticed and which is truly remarkable is uh, the maxim, service with a smile. I mean, that I do see is stands true for BKs as much as, you know, in authentic terms, it's, I've always experienced this. What do you think brings this forth from people associated with BK? How does it come so naturally to them? Uh, and they, I mean, the people who do different kinds of service uh, and people from all faiths, I don't see that it resonates the same way with a lot of those other people. Uh, but with BKs, that definitely stands true. Uh, what do you think is the rash, you know, reason behind it? What kind of really sets this dynamic? Um, we would say that at the spiritual university, we're studying four subjects. One is knowledge, the other is meditation, the third is the application of this in our lives, and the fourth is service. And what we find is that the deeper my understanding of spirituality and the deeper my experience of meditation, the more I'm actually filled with that joy and that happiness in which then I wish to share. And whatever talents and skills I may have, I want to share those so that others can also benefit. And so I know that I've learned talents and skills that I didn't have before. But also we have people who bring their talents and skills and whatever it may be, whether it be in this amazing art of cuisine in the kitchen, you know, they use their talents to serve through that, or whether it's other technical things that they know about. Each one wants to share whatever it is they've experienced and the talents they have in the service of others, because it brings so much happiness in return. And so, yes, you've seen us work through the programs we were doing last year from early morning through to late night. And it was a joy for everyone to participate. And so we find that everybody wants to do something to help others. And, you know, they have this image in India that the Gordhan Mountain was lifted when everybody gave their little finger of cooperation. 
And so we see that this is how it happens. If there's something little that I can do, I want to contribute that. Mm -hmm. And so each one is here as a volunteer. We don't have any paid staff, not a single person. And each one is just simply sharing out of their hearts with love because it brings them happiness and they're sharing something of value of happiness for others. No, truly amazing. I mean, I can watch for the food, simple food, <laughs> and it tastes amazing always. I don't know how you do that. Uh, and <laughs> some of the other aspects, like you said, uh, cooperation, and I think that image was never clearer to me. I mean, the, the mountain and everyone's finger beneath it and the sense of cooperation because everyone has put in that little effort. So I guess that's the reason why you call it the Global Cooperation House, which in, in my thinking is a very, very uh, apt uh, name uh, for, uh, for the building. Uh, and uh, one more thing which I wanted to highlight was that uh, you never have to pay for anything at uh, Global Cooperation House. So I mean, uh, there's several times, and I feel a little guilty because every time I'm offered this kind of uh, spread of, uh, you know, any time I go and they would always say, oh, please uh, have some food. And I'll say, like, look, I haven't done anything to deserve that. But it's always there, you know, uh, and it's always uh, done with, you know, full respect. And we always invite it to the kitchen and serve whatever is there. So everything is free, and I, I don't know how you manage that. So it's, it's, it's truly remarkable. Um, how do you do that uh, in terms of financial resources? Because I'm sure uh, uh, there's, there's nothing like, uh, you know, you don't get funding from the government. You're not funded. <laughs> no. no, we don't. And um, we don't have membership fees. We don't charge for our courses. And of course, if you happen to be there at the right moment, then the food is also available. And again, it doesn't carry a price tag. Um, whoever has benefited from the teachings mm -hmm. wants to contribute in some way. Some will contribute with mm -hmm. finances, some will their time and energy, some with their skills, everything, different things. But each one's contribution then makes the whole place tick. And so it's seamless. Mm -hmm. And it comes from the principle that if I have received benefit, Mm -hmm. then what I want to do is to share benefit so that then others can also come and take benefit from that. And so we found that you don't have to charge for anything, that if someone's taken some benefit, they're going to want to contribute in some form or another. And so it works according to the spiritual law. If you received, then you're going to want to give in return also. I think that's very well put. What you give, you always get that in return, and nature ensures that. So I, I see that in practice uh, at BK's. Uh, and uh, I think a lot of people, including myself, we have hugely benefited uh, from the association with BK's. Now, uh, moving on, uh, I have a question. And uh, this is a question which uh, some people have asked me because they've seen uh, the BK's always in the white. Uh, you know, they wear they don a white sari or a white uh, suit or a white uh, kurta pajama, so it's always yeah. white. <laughs> and uh, the other thing is, uh, uh, you know, there's a huge premium for some reason uh, in in the world on celibacy. So you know, and I believe that BKs don't uh, marry or, or they don't kind of lead a life of uh, uh, kind of uh, you know in the same way like we do in the world outside. So uh, what do you think uh, is the logic or the rationale uh, behind it? Why it is white? Why are uh, there celibacy? Is there a kind of a spiritual reason? Is that something that you would like to talk about? I mean, you don't have to, but if you want to uh, talk about that, uh, I'm sure the viewers would be very interested in learning more. Sure, no problem. It's good to ask very open questions because there's always a good reason for doing things. Mm -hmm. And firstly, the white. Um, people who come here for meditation or who um, follow these ideas in their lives and are surrendered in the sense that this is their work full time, they prefer to wear white because it's a symbol of simplicity and purity. I don't have to think about matching accessories. I don't have to think about, does this work with this? It's a simplification of my time and energy and money. 
and if I'm wearing um, a sari that I've had for five years, 10 years, she wouldn't notice. And so I don't have to keep renewing my wardrobe or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So it's a symbol of simplicity. It's also the symbol of purity. Mm -hmm. And so when, when people who have jobs outside and live at home with their families, they wear colored clothes at home. But when they're here, they prefer just to keep things simple and clean. And so then it's white. Mm -hmm. And in terms of celibacy, there are two very important reasons why um, people who are married, like my mother was 25 when she came to Raj Yoga, mm -hmm. and my father was 31, 32, something like that. So we came to London, uh, me and my little brother, in 1957. And my mother had already started meditation in India about eight months earlier. So she brought those teachings with herself. And of course, she continued to stay in the family. And my father was very supportive. And then after some years, he himself started to practice meditation. And that continued till the end of their days. And so marriage or not marriage isn't a question. Because if you are married already, of course, there's a responsibility. And that pure love continues. Um, but the question is about celibacy, whether inside or outside marriage, that's not a factor, but celibacy itself. And this is because if I want to experience the state of the inner being, the soul, and to make that connection with the divine, the more I'm able to practice the awareness of the inner being and not get pulled by the physical senses, the easier it is for me to experience that connection with the divine. That's the most important factor. And the second factor is the, the same principle that Gandhiji followed. He knew that each human being has a certain amount of energy. And either you can use that energy just for physical gratification, or you can use that energy for a higher purpose and have a life in which you're surrendered for that higher purpose. And for him, it was the liberation of Bharat, which was wonderful. And for us, it is a feeling that this is now the time of transformation in the world. And so if I can give my time and energy. But we got interrupted at a very, very critical point, And you were explaining something which is, I think, which needs to be understood. Uh, essentially, because uh, in our tradition and cultures, especially in India, when I was growing up, uh, there was a lot of emphasis on uh, this kind of uh, thinking that, you know, celibacy is superior and uh, there's a huge amount of premium on how uh, uh, boys and girls should not be indulging in anything which we call, let's say, sexual behavior. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of misunderstanding as well as to why people should stay celibate or uh, not stay celibate. So, you know, uh, without making any judgment, uh, I had to ask you this question, and I think you kind of very nicely explained. Would you like to kind of, you know, we got you interpreted, so would you like to just complete what you were saying? Um, I was pointing out that Mahatma Gandhi was very aware that energy has to be directed in a specific way. And so he chose to direct his energy um, into the whole liberation movement, which was fantastic. But um, also today, if I look at the state of the world, mm -hmm. I see how much needs to be transformed. And so our principle is that if we can direct our energy in service to be able to transform ourselves and then secondly, help in the transformation of the world, then that energy being conserved is very valuable. And the reality that I saw in my own family and my own home was that the relationship between my parents was one of great love and respect. And so it's certainly only one tiny factor within the family situation in marriage. And so I saw that it works very, very well when there is celibacy or purity being maintained. No, amazing. But would you agree uh, that this should be voluntary? I mean, this should be out of one's own volition? Uh, in, in agreement with one's own requirement, or how, how would you put it? it? It has to be from one's own heart. It can never be something which is dictated by another. 
And so when a person is ready and they want to give it that priority and that attention, that's what they're going to do. It's never something that can be imposed. I think that's something which uh, a lot of people need to understand because yeah. there, there's a certain kind of uh, scriptural uh, kind of reinforcement of these kind of ideas and that creates a lot of confusion and angst yeah. uh, and I've yeah. seen that. So, no, uh, so, you know, BKs are a global movement. You have presence uh, in almost every part of the world and it blends very well with people of different faith and traditions. Uh, you respect uh, people from all faiths and all walks of life. And uh, how does that translate? I mean, you know, traditionally anything uh, which is spiritual and from India is seen like an extension of the Hindu thought. Would you, how would you put it? I mean, uh, do you think uh, this is suitable for uh, people from different faiths, say Islam or Christianity or uh, any other faith for that matter? Um, if you look at all the traditions of the world, um, at the heart of all the traditions is spirituality. And within the concept of spirituality, maybe there are two things that come which are most important. The awareness of values, spiritual values in life, and we share the same values in every tradition. And secondly, the relationship with the divine. And so meditation or reflection, prayer, focuses on that side of it. And so what we are doing is actually putting across these universal concepts and ideas so that people can be in their own faith but benefit from all of this. Because when you begin to meditate, that's when you're also in touch with yourself. And those original qualities within yourself begin to emerge and be expressed in life. The other aspect is that, yes, our roots are in India and if you think about this word, Adi, Sanatan, Devi, Devta, Dharma, the original religion of Bharat, of India, is actually the Devta Dharma. And in thinking about this word Dharma, it's not just religion, it's much more than that. It's actually a way of being. It's a way of living. And so, and the word Devta, divine. How is it that I can express the divinity because we're the creation of the divine. So all of us carry that divinity within ourselves. And so how can I express that divinity in my way of living, in my way of being? And so the spiritual university is teaching these things. And so yes, definitely, I'm wearing a sari. And so this is an indication of my own roots in India. Um, and we celebrate all the festivals of India also, but with the spiritual significance and that deeper meaning. But we believe that these ideas and concepts are relevant for every human being today, not just in one part of the world or in one tradition, but for everyone. And I think that spiritual teachings actually lie at the heart of every single tradition. And we come together with that awareness. And so no difference in terms of one tradition with the other when we look at that central core. So, uh, you know, as a leader, I would like to ask you a question because you, you are an exemplary leader as well. Uh, and you kind of uh, guide a lot of us, a lot of people, uh, you know, in this country and globally. Uh, there is a question today, uh, and that is the growth of the ultra right wing in many parts of the world, including in the United Kingdom and Europe. And you've seen that in the United States as well. And there's kind of almost an unspoken war of some kind. There's a uh, right wing Islam, uh, you know, the ultra right wing where they are kind of, they don't want to accept any other way of living. And then there's ultra fascist right wing, uh, you know, in every other part of the world. And there's some kind of a situation which, you know, which is a kind of unspoken war of some kind. And this is fueled by people with different interests in politics, definitely politics because that kind of helps to grab power, uh, but also people in business because it helps them to kind of gain a certain kind of edge. Uh, what do you think is the situation? I mean, how do you kind of diffuse this? How uh, do you think uh, we 
can live peacefully uh, will you know the the tenets of islam as it is practiced in certain parts of the world is that in uh, kind of uh, uh, in sync with the other faiths and religions what do you think is the way forward i mean this is not an easy question so i don't expect you to have a simple answer but uh, would you rather throw some light on this um, what I'm seeing is that there's a huge amount of division and polarization in the world. And every country seems to be showing the situation in different ways. And so what I believe that the answer is, the answer is to have the vision of one family, one planet, one home. And it's actually a very simple answer to your very, very complex question. Yeah. But I really do believe that spirituality teaches me to be connected with that being that I am, the light that shines inside Atma, the soul, and to see you as Atma, the soul, and to see that light. And if I can see other people, not in terms of their designation, not in terms of their position, or even their religion or their race, if I can see them as lights, as the living being, the soul, then I can feel that kinship with all of them and begin to see them as part of one family. In India, we have this beautiful concept of Vasudha Kutumba, that we are one family across the world. And so I think this very ancient idea that people used to believe in and practice, it's time to bring back that truth once again into our living. And if you think about the problems that are facing humanity today, it's not just the question of religion or even ethnicity or color. These are, of course, huge problems, but there's also problems that we need to come together and tackle as a global family. I'm thinking about climate change, I'm thinking about the pandemic. No one country or one race or one tradition can solve these problems on their own. It's only when we change our vision and our attitude and we see each other as belonging to one family, then together as one family, we can sort things out. This is why that image of the Gordhan Parvat, the mountain, is such an interesting one. It's everybody coming together and as one family, we can help this planet. Um, I'll give you one simple example. Here's a boat, and water starts leaking in one part of the boat. And I'm sitting on this side of the boat, and I say, well, I'm fine, nothing to do with me, it's mm -hmm. those people there, mm -hmm. but it's the same boat. And within a short space of time, the water that's coming in through there is going to reach my feet, mm -hmm. and it's also going to take me down. Mm -hmm. And so I can't say that this is a problem of one country or one group of people or anything like that. It's a big family, a universal family, and we are facing problems on so many different levels. And we have to learn to see each other with that vision of brotherhood, of one family. So when I'm in the awareness of the soul, I see you as my brother. And if I'm in the awareness of the physical form, the physical identity, there's many, many divisions and barriers that take us apart. And so I think that this is that moment of transformation. The pandemic has actually brought people together, making us realize that we're facing the same enemy. And so I think that we have to apply this awareness of one family on every aspect of the situations we're living in. And you see what happens is there's a lot of misinformation or actually on the other side, there's also a lot of ignorance. So I don't know what other people believe or what they believe or why they believe. But if I were to make friends with somebody mm -hmm. and maybe they happen to be my neighbor, and if I get to know them as a human being, I'll find that my fears, my joys, my sorrows, my trials and tribulations, my tears and my laughter are the same as my neighbors. We have more in common than we have in terms of differences. Mm -hmm. But in a world of misinformation and ignorance, it's the divisions that get enhanced. And so I think that one of the things that 
people who are aware need to do is to reach out and make friends across all the different boundaries so that we're able to build bridges and not create barriers. Very well put. I mean, I couldn't have asked for a better answer. Uh, it comes back to the basic tenets of Global Cooperation House, which is cooperating with each other. And what you said, I think it also possibly is one of the basic tenets of Islam, where everyone is seen as equal. I mean, every single soul is, is part of the same universe and is equal in, in, in the eyes of the Almighty or you know, whichever way you want to interpret it. So I don't understand where all these divisions have actually sprung from. Uh, and it's uh, kind of creating uh, a level of tension in different parts of the world. Do you think it's also the duty of uh, the well-to-do people to kind of go and solve the crisis of other nationalities, regions, like the global migrant crisis, which we see operation in, oppression of a certain kind in certain parts of the world? Do you think uh, the people who are empowered, Western nations, for example, they need to reach out and do something to restore people's uh, faith in their garments or lives? <laughs> um, I don't know how we can change the people who are at the top of the ladder in terms of politics. But what I do know is that if there are people on the grassroots who come together, mm -hmm. then the movement of grassroots wanting peace together, wanting to live in harmony together, mm -hmm. is definitely going to go further up. And that sound of peace is going to reach the people who are in leadership roles. Um, the voice of the people, it's actually a very interesting time in human history mm -hmm. when people who are voiceless now have a very strong voice through the internet, through technology. Mm -hmm. And so their voices can now be heard. And yes, definitely, if I think about the global north and the global south and how much has been taken from the global south in terms of resources by the global north, mm -hmm. then I think that there has to be some sort of equilibrium and equity. And so there has to be some sort of relationship of give and take that's established now. Mm -hmm. Now, how that happens, I don't know, but at least I can begin with myself. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is I can do to help my neighbor, mm -hmm. let me be mm -hmm. starting to do that. Let me have a heart that's big and generous, that's able not just to love my little family of three or four or five, but can I extend that out and have kindness and compassion for everybody around me? And, you know, we can change a culture. Um, at the moment, there's this culture in which the darkness is increasing and we're declining. But there's another thing that's coming up. And that's a culture of compassion, of kindness, of generosity, a culture in which people are interested in spiritual matters. And so all of that is happening and it's moving forward. And so I think that if we have that hope and we have that faith, then together we can bring about a change in the world and make things work differently. Well, thank you. So I'm just going to ask you a personal question. So, you know, you did hint about your family. What made you come and join BK and at what age and what kind of motivated you so much to give your life uh, to this organization? Uh, it's kind of unusual. Uh, and I don't see that very many people can do that. <laughs> um, I was very fortunate that my family was in contact with the Brahma Kumari since I was a child. Mm -hmm. And so we then came to London. But every time we went to India, I would meet Daddy Janki, who you know very well. Um, she's now passed away in March, age 104. Yeah. But she was an amazing beacon of light for the world. Um, and the connection with her continued through my teenage years. Um, and then when I was 19, I, was, I spent um, a gap year in India. I decided that that was important for me to get back to my roots and connect. And within the first three months of being in India, the vibration of India touched my, my heart and my head. And I said, well, let me find out what the Brahma Kumaris are actually teaching. And once I understood the spiritual teachings, I thought, 
this is something that all my friends would want to know about. Everyone should know about these ideas. And that's when I decided that this was to be my life. And I haven't changed my mind since. But obviously, it does fulfill you at some level because to give so much and to <laughs> kind of dedicate your life it has to have a very strong uh, uh, pull there. Um, it's actually no type of renunciation or sacrifice that's felt at all. Rather, there's a huge amount of treasure, of experience and skills and everything else that I've learned in my life. Um, I, I wouldn't have been able to learn it in any other way. But the spiritual university gave me the opportunity to have a huge amount of attainment. And so I really don't see that I've made any sacrifice at all, but rather I've gained so much. And yes, there's been a huge amount of benefit. So we're coming to the end of the show, Sister Jenti. It doesn't feel like, I don't know, I mean, I thought <laughs> there's just like a few minutes we've been talking. It seems like it's almost time to end the show. Uh, before we come to the closure, would you like to give a message to London, to the city, uh, to this very great multicultural beacon of hope for the world? Would you like to give a message? And would you like to maybe do a one minute of uh, meditation or you want to pass it on, whatever you feel appropriate? Um, well, my message to Londoners would be um, take a pause. Just take a moment to go inside and connect with the beauty of the spirit that you are within. And when you feel that goodness and peace within, then you find that you're better equipped to cope with all the stresses and tensions that life in a big city throws at you. And so just keep trying, going back here inside to the awareness of that inner light that you are. And in fact, let's have a minute in which we experiment with this idea. And literally, it takes only a minute. And I'll share my own thoughts with you, and let's go on that journey. Going inwards, I visualize a point of light shining in the center of my forehead. And I go deeper and deeper within, and I feel this point of peace. I am light, I am peace. I hold this awareness and allow that light to radiate out and peace to radiate out into the city. I hold this awareness that this is truly my original state of being, my natural state of being. And now, as I come back to the moment here and now, I keep this awareness of I, the being of light, the being of peace. Literally, it takes just a minute and you can go in and connect with that peace. And it makes life much, much sweeter and also definitely more manageable. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thanks a lot, Sister Jenti, for being with us here. Om Shanti, and uh, hopefully we see you again uh, in London on this channel, and uh, we talk to you again. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Viewers, I hope you enjoyed the show, and we'll be again here next Saturday, 4 p.m.,
to an ode to this great city, the Manish Tiwari Show. Thank you very much.